You are eclectic to say the least. You know, I'm, I'm watching you with the orchestra. I'm watching you with the big band. I'm watching with Joey DeFrancesco and Christian McBride. I was listening mm-hmm. to the Standards Trio. Pretty amazing, actually. And what's interesting that I love about your approach is you, you treat the guitar, in most cases, like a musical instrument and not like a guitar. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, you're, you are, when you're a member of the orchestra, yes, you're the soloist in, in that, you know, on that orchestral piece or a big band piece, but you are a musical instrument. And, and that's, that's unusual. I know that sounds really weird to say, but that's unusual. It seems like a lot of uh, your colleagues and all of that, it's um, the guitar holds, it seems to hold a different place. And I think that you, by the way that you go about your melodic approach, you honor all of the other instruments with your approach. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I I always feel that whether you're a soloist or any other role in the band, that everybody's function all the time is to make everybody else sound as good as you can. I feel like if I'm soloing, I'm actually accompanying the rhythm section. Like I feel... I like to I like to flip it like that so that you don't feel like you're being just supported and then you're just flying on top of what's going on, but rather that I'm comping for the people who are comping for me. You know, that's that's what it feels like. Yeah, that makes total sense to me because you're not playing the guitar as much as you are making music. Yeah, well, thank so you. Happens, you've got a guitar in your hands. Yeah, I try to... Um, get past the instrument and and get to the music you know as much as i can well that's that's what it, that's what was really apparent to me and and it was uh i was watching the uh the zoom piece that you did with the uh hardcore orchestra yeah that had to be a challenge and fun at the same time <laughs> yeah it was amazing how fast that actually came together faster than it would have if we had to you know organize everybody to actually go to the same place and and uh you know actually record in a room and together basically we had the idea and i contacted my friend uh philip manier who wrote the arrangement he wrote the arrangement in like three days he contacted all the musicians sent them the score and something to play to week and a half we had it back i put my part on there and then we mixed it and the longest job was doing the video which michaela and uh and her boyfriend Vojta did that took the longest time that took about i guess about a week and a half and and then it was finished it was really amazing and actually the, we were amazed that the sound of the orchestra came together very easily when we started mixing it. it we just put all the faders up and everybody's part just really just fell into place and it sounded beautiful and it was surprising you know for those, of you, was, for those of you who'll be watching this that don't have any idea what we're talking about <laughs> Why don't you explain to them what this project is, the Hardcore Orchestra? Yeah, so, um, you know, we decided to do something in the lockdown times, something to bring people together and, you know, to have a just make a project for people to become involved in. And so we decided to make an arrangement of one of my songs and uh, make an orchestral arrangement and send it out to a lot of musicians that we know and to have them play on it and then bring it back to uh, HQ and mix it and make a video of it where uh, everybody's recording themselves. And, and so the end result is the whole orchestra on the screen together and this performance of this, of this song with this beautiful arrangement. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's like, a, for those of you who might not know, it's like a big Zoom meeting. Yeah. It's like you're all in a big Zoom <laughs> conference call. And, uh, it's like yeah. the ultimate version of Hollywood Squares for musicians, if you will. It was, <laughs> yeah. about, it was about 30 pieces or so It's in that ballpark. Uh, boy, I think it was more like 60. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to exaggerate. I was going to say 45, and I say, no, if I say 45, I didn't go and count them all, you know, but if I say 45, he's going to think I'm exaggerating. And so I said, 40. But no, I, you know, there's probably is 60 of them on there for sure. Uh, there's something multiple, like that. Multiple double basses. Uh, there's probably yeah. 15 or 20 yes. violins. It's a full orchestra. Yeah, it, it's crazy. And uh, and then 
the dynamics of it is what's so startling because the dynamics of it is it goes down to like, you know, 50 dB or less or zero dB. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden there's this guy with this guitar that pops up on the screen. <laughs> and then you play this really, really nice, delicate, melodic, you know, melodic, simple melody, really. But it's just beautiful in a way that it fits. And that's obviously your composition. That was pretty amazing, actually, th th to hear that. And again, that's your approach when you hit your, um, and that, this is what's important to me, when, when you decided, you know, when you came in to play the melody, it, it supported everything that was going on in front of it. And um, that's pretty, was pretty astounding to me to hear that. I, I was like, wow, that's, that's very, very cool. I, I loved it, actually. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's fast forward um, or go back, however, to the to the big band project that you're in, you're involved in um, over there. Yeah, sure. You're talking about OJM in in Portugal, right? Yes. the The OJM band is based in Porto, Portugal, and it stands for Orquestra de Jazz de Machacinos, and it's a great big band that I've been working with for about thirteen years, and. Ten years ago, we made an album called Our Secret World. It was a wonderful adventure with them, and I'm really proud of that album. The directors of the band called me up and said that the 10th anniversary of the album is coming up, and would I like to come and perform a concert over there? So, wow. so that's what we did. I went over there. We had one rehearsal, and we did the the, the concert, and it was just wonderful to play and you know to uh, played for a socially distanced audience it was a blast and it was live streamed and we played all the material from the record and a, and a few other songs that we've been developing since that time i think we're going to do another record next year mm -hmm. and uh it was just beautiful it's, it's a wonderful band they're they're such a tight-knit uh family and a really warm sound and you know that's that's something nice in a big band because the big band can 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 be very large and and kind of cold sometimes you right. know and you know this band just has a really warm intimate kind of sound with each other and a really beautiful feeling you know amongst the people so it's a project that i love to to be a part of that was it was amazing it was just a blessing to be able to to go over there and and play at all you know during these yeah. times so it was really felt really great and i thought the the streaming came out wonderful, actually. It sounded so much better than it sounded in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> because the band was socially distanced as well. So, yep. Yep. <laughs> so you know, everybody's facing a di different direction. <laughs> that, that definitely can be a challenge. You know, funny thing about big bands is, um, you know, when big bands have been together a long time, they do develop a voice. And you, yeah. can, really, you can really tell that from a big band that's like, a bunch of guys show up at the gig and get a bunch of charts and they play the charts well because mm. these guys are, you know, all these guys are, you know, pros. And whenever I hear big bands, they're usually good musicians. Of but there's a, big, there's a difference between, between, let's say, 15 or 18 talented musicians playing charts and 15 to 18 to 20 talented musicians that have been playing together for a long time. Yeah, so just this morning I was listening to uh, Mood Indigo by Duke Ellington's band. And that is a perfect example of, of that. I mean, oh my God, the the character and quality of the sound is like nothing else. It's, it's yeah. so intimate and so personal. It's such an incredible <laughs> level of musicianship. Yeah. And, and, then, and then we go to, you know, like you playing with Joey DeFrancesco and Christian McBride and, and, and that whole thing killing it old school bebop swing yeah just killing it i mean so you get a guy i don't have a guitar close but i usually have a guitar like right here but you're playing this you know these these melodic beautiful melodic lines that almost nursery right lines you know on, on this gorgeous orchestral pieces and all that kind of thing and then you turn the page and there you are in that setting just laying down some, excuse my expression, laying down some shit. I mean, I mean, it's just really, 
you know, showing you're, you're showing the folks back home that you didn't forget you're from Philadelphia is what you're doing. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely deep Philly, man. Deep Philly, yeah. for sure. That was so much fun to reconnect with with those guys. And, you know, we hadn't played since high school together. Wow. And so it was just a blast. And it was just big love on the stage every night, every set, and, you know, just overflowing with joy and, and love and fun playing. And we just had a, a ball and was a really a deep, wonderful time, just really a, a, a joyful time. I think the, everybody felt it in the room. And it was just wonderful to uh, just have a ball like that and just really enjoy and go deep and really just bring it home you that, know? Was, that was that was i mean that was as good as it gets man that was like freaking ridiculous how good that was and those guys on the stage with you i mean it's uh, just a uh, just a uh, you know yeah he has a, I, a hyperbole i don't like to be too hyperbolic on stuff but i mean uh i mean you know that was i mean freaking joey de francesco and christian mcbride yourself and little john and little john yeah you know he plays in atlanta quite a bit yeah yeah, he's yeah, and he, you know, he's a monster. And this is incredible. Yeah, just crazy what's going on on this stage. And I'm going, good <laughs> God, man, good God, it was just awesome. So how do you how do you flip gears like that in your own head? I mean, just I mean, uh, the 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 chops that that are required to do what you did on that stage in those pieces are just ridiculous. I mean, it's I mean your articulation is flawless and and i have no idea what that tempo was but damn it was it was smoking on this <laughs> one particular tune and and your articulation is completely flawless so so you go in and, and that's got nothing to do with your harmony choices your lines and you know every everything else the phrasing and all that whole thing but that still requires i mean are you are you practicing every day like that i mean do you, do you do you think about your chops when you when you're because you compose, you play piano, you do all these things, but yeah. man, you ripped that off like uh, like shredders wish they could, man. It was pretty amazing, <laughs> actually. Do you are you are you conscious of your chops still? Are you still something you still work on? Uh, yeah, a fair bit. Uh, there's definitely places that I that I want to get to that I'm, you know, kind of working on more in my mind than than actually on the instrument. Um, uh you know just trying to visualize the kind of space the improvisational space that i want to occupy and how that is technically possible and what i do is i i work on sound a lot when i'm uh at home alone and you know because the the sound and the response is the thing that unlocks the doors to being free and being able to handle something like fast tempos or just be able to express the way that I want to, regardless of how complicated it is, just from a sonic point of view. Let me ask you a question about that real quick, because I, I want to make yeah. sure we're talking about the same thing. When you talk about response, are you talking about the way the guitar is responding to your touch? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about the way the, way the guitar feels physically and then also how the sound comes back to me based right. on what I'm playing. Right. So, you know, I like a, a very fast response and a very accurate response all over the neck. I use um, pretty thin strings now. I used, to, I used to do the whole 13s and usually 12s, but, you know, string gauge. But uh, in the past couple of years, I've been playing 10s, actually, and with, with a very low uh, action so that so that all the our, all the articulation is is very uh, immediate and and the movements required are are very soft actually right. so so that dexterity challenge, challenge of the right hand as well yeah it's well you know it's the the way I kind of conceive of it is like you know the the left hand is playing the notes and I have a fairly strong left hand so that I can actually even play without the right hand a lot. I use the right hand to kind of do the syncopation or the articulation of the notes, you know, of the right. rhythmic phrasing, you know, kind of compensating for the, for the topography of the left hand, right. but most of it's in the left hand. And I like that really 
fast and strong response when I when I play a note so that I don't have to work super hard to to get a note out so that I can just kind of be very fluid. Right. So I work on sound, like the response and and the equipment and and how that's interacting with the technique. Let's start with the guitar. Just just that's the instrument. Uh, that's the controller, if you will. Yeah. So I see you're playing a Yamaha solid body. I see you playing a custom thin line arch top. I see you playing a yeah. D'Angelico that's a kind of a modified thin line. You know, you're yeah. playing a lot of different instruments. Where are you? Where are you at now? And how do you make those choices and and that kind of thing? And then we'll get to pedals and sound and all of that because that has to enter into it. Yeah. Well, I was playing um, my uh, Westville Vanguard, which is a guitar maker from Tokyo, and uh, I have a signature guitar with them. Right. And I was I was playing that for a, for a long time. Also playing the D'Angelico, which I love D'Angelico as well. Mm -hmm. That's more kind of the uh, classic uh, semi hollow arch top vibe, and. Um, and then I I uh, I found that Yamaha SG two hundred, and I just fell in love with it. it. It was such a revelation to me physically. It was it just feels like satin and right. and so smooth and so easy, so generous and and just really doesn't get in the way and and is and is a, just a real pleasure to play. Those are the guitars also, but this one, you know, I like the really thin neck. I also like the, the double cutaway. The way that the SG hangs on the shoulders, it positions your left hand at the, more at the, like the 12th fret naturally so that you're already oriented to the higher register, which I right. yeah. really yeah. love. And the other guitars would be oriented naturally more to the lower registers you know you played a 335 at one time i know right uh, yeah 335 yeah, I mean, your, your hand is out you can't see but your hand is out here you know yeah you, know, saying, you want it more like a telly or something like that where it's down in this your hands exactly. right, you're, you're looking down on your fingers a little bit it's more exactly exactly so uh so i really fell in love with with this guitar and kind of much to the chagrin of of my <laughs> guitar <laughs> companies they were like what <laughs> but um now they're in the process of coming up with their own sort of uh answer to that evolution in 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 what i'm digging these days so i'm really excited about some new models that are going to be coming out very cool uh, in the next year or something like that So let's talk about uh, amps for a second. What, what, are you, what are you using for amps? I had always been using uh, Fender Twin Reverbs um, because that was what you could get on the road. That was like the best amp you could find uh, consistently. So I just was using those a lot. And then I got into the uh, Axe Effects from Fractal Audio. And when they came out with that, I started messing around with that. And went through a lot of different kind of hybrid setups with um with going directly into the speaker of the of you know just going right into a power amp and then into the speaker right. cabinet of the fender twin reverb and that was nice because you got the air being pushed and then also getting deeper into the the modeling parameters and trying to get a consistent sound that i liked from the monitors when i'd go to a gig and that was kind of iffy because you know a lot of the monitors aren't very good um yeah. so i actually found that the the consistency from night to night was actually worse when i was using the monitors and the axe effects than i was using the the fender twin reverb because the fender twin reverbs are quite consistent but the uh, monitors was w were having a lot of inconsistency that being said i i really like the controllability if you have a good monitor of how you can really shape the sound in the axe effects. So I'm using, I'm actually using the Fender Twin Reverb model <laughs> in the in the axe effects, and then you can get in there and you know control shape the bias or the the feedback and all these parameters that affect 
the response of the amp. And so in the past couple of years, I've, I've really gotten deeply into tailoring the particular type of of Fender Twin Reverb that I would ideally like, you know, because they also differ from day to day if the tubes are biased differently or right. if they're older or newer. And, you know, sometimes the, the high end is, is, the treble is very harsh and some older ones, the treble is very smooth. And, and more importantly, some of them are very fast. You play a note and a note comes right out and other ones are real slow and they have that kind of dip and, and droop to them the sag i think you know it's, and, yeah. and so in the in the modeling software you can actually tailor that as a actual parameter and get the right balance between hardness and generosity of of tone sure. bl bloom you know right so right. so as long as you have a good monitor then then that becomes the uh, the the really nice sound and so i've been doing that i i have on my rider that the venues should provide a a high quality um full range monitor mm. for me to use and then i can go stereo and then i can go into the house just right out of my gear so that's what i do these days i take my axe effects with me i just go xlr out of that into the house and also into the monitors which i put behind me like an amplifier so that's been really cool that's unique you're putting the monitor behind you that that's interesting that you do that mm -hmm. my background again is in pro audio so i have an fx8 which is an axe effects it's the oh, yeah. effects end of it without the the amp modeling and um so i've messed i've messed with the fractal quite a bit i find that the um the effects in those things are pretty spectacular um yeah it's got They're the wonderful. best it's got the best compression I, i've heard in a in a pedal period for guitar, it just the thing just works great, and the reverbs are huge and, and all that. So, so all of I mean, I know that your signal path over the years has been pretty. Uh, what's the word people like to use? Robust. Um, you had a pretty <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> very robust. <laughs> you had a pretty big signal path there for a while. Uh, I, yeah. Now you're probably doing the same thing within the axe effects. So is there a particular signal flow that you that you are drawn to or that you're using more now these days than say in the past or Yeah, I um come out of the guitar mm -hmm. and into a rat distortion pedal. I love those guys. I I knew the guy yeah. who invented that thing. Oh, you met him? You know him? Well, yeah, I used to represent them back in oh. the Broco. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Charlie, Charlie's Charlie's long gone now, but uh he was a B3 player. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. No, that Proco Rat, and I, they. Um, That's I just the best them. one. Yeah, you know, everybody uses that freaking pedal, and I had about six <laughs> of them samples, and I gave them all away, you know. And I and I don't even have one. Anymore. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, I've got a couple from the '80s. That that's just the one, you know. I well, bought it. New get rid of them. Yeah, never. Yeah, I I bought them new in the '80s, you know, and. Uh, and I still have a couple of them. So I, you know, I've, I've never found a distortion pedal that is better or even close nope. as good, you know. Nope, they just hit on something. So you got a rat, then you go into what? So I got the rat and then I go into the, into the um, Axe Effects 3. And that, so then the signal chain becomes uh, in, in the unit itself and it's a beautiful unit because the user interface is so clear and you know, you can, you can make your signal path as complex or simple as you want it. Right. Parallel, pal parallel effects and, and different, um, you know, any, any kind of, you know, signal chain that you want. So basically, and, and it's also got three ins and outs physical outputs in the, in the back. So right. I also integrate a couple pedals, that I also play with that the that the fractal can't do. One of them is the um, is the Pog two from yes, EA Deck, Pog. and another one is the the Super Octave, the OC three, the the Boss. There's not uh, any pedal that I've discovered that does what that does, which is enable you to only activate the a range of bass notes, and then the rest is open. So you have bass, octave, down your chords are free so i use that 
in the signal chain, I, I go, I feed out and come back in only with the bass signal and I mix that into the signal. And then I have it as a, a pedal on the pedal controller, the MIDI controller that controls the the box so I can turn that bass on and off from right. my feet. And then it's basically like a, a compressor. So it comes in and then there's a compressor. Right. And then it and then it goes out to the pog too and I shave off some attack with that and bring it back and use the compressor to push the bring transient back. back to the back yeah. to the uh point make where up, I'm make, actually make playing. Up. Yeah. Yeah. And um when you shave off the attack, you know, you basically you're doing a volume swell. You right. Know? So you have this you have this curve, you know. Right. And and and, and I just like to slam that with a compressor so that it's so that it's a very fast curve right. so it pushes that curve back up to the moment i'm playing so I, I i do a lot of uh things and spend a lot of attention on working on the transient of of the of the attack of the guitar you know i always wish we just had a adsr you know <laughs> for it that would be that would just solve the the whole issue <laughs> and it's something that every synth has you know and um i've always just kind of tried to find some ways to get a similar kind of ability to shape the the transient you know yeah because i have a certain thing in mind you know so anyway i come back use a compressor and then go into the amp model, which is what I was describing before, the uh, Fender Twin Reverb model. And then into the cab modeler, which is also just a Fender Twin Reverb cab modeler. And then, and then it splits off to a couple delays and and some reverb. And then it's and then it's out. You're done. Yeah. So when you do use like an overdrive tone, you're picking that up from the uh, from the Rat. Yeah. Now is the Rat on all the time? Is it like no. A, like a, no, it's just you just use it when you want to overdrive. Yeah. Very, very cool. Well, thanks yeah. for going through all that with us, man. I really appreciate that. That's a, My pleasure. a lot going on there for sure. And I know there's a lot of people that are going to go, now, what did he do? What's he doing? What's he doing? What is that? You know, so <laughs> that, you know the, there's a lot of people out there that are going to want to know that kind of thing. What's uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel doing today, tomorrow, in the next couple of days? Yeah, uh, tons of stuff. This is a really busy uh, moment. I'm <clears throat> involved in many, so many things. You know, I have my record label, Hardcore Records, mm -hmm. and we've got uh, several things going on at the moment. I'm producing an album for a, a wonderful artist in, in Brazil, and his name is Daniel Santiago. Uh, so I'm I'm producing his album, and that is almost getting uh, is almost ready to mix. So it's a really exciting time. Right. All of the last touches of the recording for all the songs are being are being done, and we're flying things back and forth between Berlin and Brasilia. And that's a beautiful, beautiful album. Uh, Clapton is playing on one song, and um, so I'm I'm doing that and. Also, getting ready to mix uh, a solo piano album that I recorded in lockdown of me playing solo piano. And you know, it's really funny that you say that because um, one of my friends was, and I did not know that you were a piano player of that caliber. And uh, he said, he said, well, ask you know, ask him about the piano. And I thought, well, what? And I'll confess to you that I did not realize it. And he said, yeah, he's as good a piano player as he is a guitar player. And his compositional stuff comes, you can tell it's very pianistic. So, uh. <laughs> so I thought, I'm not going to ask him about piano. And then... <laughs> 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 I'm telling that myself all over the place. Yeah. But, uh, we'll leave that to the piano magazine. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but, no, no I, am, I am curious about that because uh, one of the yeah. things, I mean... You, listen, we could talk for weeks on this kind of stuff because I talk about, you know, one of the things that we talked about very early in this conversation was, you know, the guitar as an instrument, not as a, as the guitar, you know. Exactly. And so, yeah. and I find that people that, that compose on piano or have pianistic skills and all of that, you know, they, they address the, the instrument very, very differently than the guy that came up playing blues and, and all, of, uh, you know, playing, going that, that route. Yeah. So um, I find it 
I, and I know he's going to find it interesting too, that you're actually making a, a piano record, which mm -hmm. um, when he told me that I went, Oh, I, you know, but now that you're, you're validating his comment about your, your piano. So are these are all original compositions. Uh, yes. Yeah. They're, they're, they're basically like, you know, as you said, like you can tell that a lot of my songs were written on piano. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm doing like the composer's version of of these songs, you know. Oh, okay. The way that the way that they were the written. They were written. Yeah, and um, so that's fun. So I'm doing that. Um, also involved in in uh, doing a project for Hardcore Records, which is involved uh, with <laughs> sorry, um, re-releasing and. Re remixing and remastering my album Hardcore. This is something that's been a dream of mine for a while. Uh, so we licensed the album from Verve Records from Universal Music. Yeah. And that's an album that I put out in 2003. Right. And I always felt like it could benefit from a more uh, updated mix and master because it was recorded and mixed all in my apartment at, you know in 2002 when I hardly had any equipment or, you know, and then, you know, my skills have improved and everything. So really want to remix and remaster that. Also, there's a song on that album called Love in the Modern World, which was intended to be an orchestral piece. And on the record, it's, it's a kind of a MIDI orchestra. And now we're going to do the version of the full orchestra. Oh, how cool is that? For that song and that re-release so i'm really excited about this and uh working on on that on the plans for that i'm also yeah we've been doing master classes and so these are really cool that that was a the last week was a deep dive into composition right and that that was a wonderful chance to formulate my philosophies and and conceptions and techniques of uh of composing right which is um so i wrote like a kind of a little a little book for that like a 40 page book and we did a whole really uh uh full produced uh presentation that was about two and a half hours long of going through a lot of of my songs like that and we're going to do another one coming up uh for guitar just guitar technique and guitar everything guitar so uh look out for that then you had mentioned eric clapton is playing on one of uh one of these tracks yeah he's he's amazing he's a beautiful guy incredible artist you know i mean it's incredible just having conversations with him i'm like wow you're eric clapton, eric clapton. <laughs> yeah. i was uh uh, I was sitting in with him at the O2 Arena in Berlin uh, yep. last last year, and I brought my kids to the to the arena, and we were backstage, and I introduced my kids to to Eric, and and Eric said to my oldest son Silas, he said, "Oh, do you so do do you play guitar? You play an instrument?" He goes, "Yeah, I play guitar," and, uh, and he goes, "Oh, that's great. What's what do you like to play?" and Sila said, oh, I really like to play uh, Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. Wow. And, and Eric said, oh, yeah, I remember when George wrote that in my garden. <laughs> but, you know, what do you, what do you say to that? You know, I know, it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know playing with him and up close i mean when he's when he gets into it when he wants to you know he go man watch out you know yeah. there's nobody like him you know and he enjoys giving giving a lot of space to Absolutely. to other artists and all the, he's very generous and and you know but when he moves in you know he's he's like no <laughs> 
you've been very generous and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I just say, to... say hi to everybody out there. And Yeah, listen, I got to tell you, it's, it was two and a half years uh, waiting for you, but it, it was well worth it. Awesome, and, man. Uh, and I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, guys like you are an inspiration. They should be an inspiration to everybody that, you know, if you're dedicated to what you do, you know, and you, and you really live it, you know, and, and that's the difference between watching a guy that's an artist and a guy that's just kind of, you know, doing other things, you know, it just, you, you feel, there's a difference. You feel that difference and, and you, you exemplify that, you know. Well, thank so, you so much. Thank you. I Kurt. appreciate, I appreciate the support. It. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Bye-bye. Okay.